Hello and welcome to the History of Modern Greece. I'm your host, Daniel Roberts, and I'm here with my father, George, and our theme music is brought to you by Mark Youngerman. This is a podcast that covers the events from the fall of ancient Greece to the modern day. This is episode 5, Homer's Iliad and the Odyssey. Because it is such an influential piece of literature in ancient Greece, we feel that it is only fair to do a summarization of the works of Homer and the other books surrounding the Trojan Wars. But first we must ask ourselves, who is Homer? Well, we don't actually know who Homer is. I mean, we are sure he didn't create the Iliad and the Odyssey himself, because they're oral legends. But he may have written them down, or he might not have existed at all. Or he might have been a collection of men, and we simply refer to all of them as Homer. The point is, we don't actually know who Homer is But what we do know is that there are many different references to the Trojan War. But it's only Homer's Iliad that brings this story to life, that gives it color. Now we also know that Homer was written in the Iron Age. But the stories that he writes about take place in the Bronze Age. Now this is hundreds of years before the whole previous millennium. Through archaeology, they have discovered that the city of Troy has been built and destroyed over nine times in the last 3,000 years. Now, Achaeans is what the Greeks called themselves back then. And we have a record from the Hittites in a tablet where the king was naming his equals in foreign lands. And he wrote the king of Babylon, the king of Egypt. And then he wrote about the king of the Achaeans. But then he scratched that name out. Almost as if for a moment he thought the king of Achaea, or the Greek king, was his equal. And then he kind of had a change of heart and scratched it out. That alone tells us a little more. Now, scientists believe that the city of Troy Homer was referring to was either the 6th or the 7th version of the city of Troy. You see, Troy 6 had the largest walls and was eventually destroyed by a powerful earthquake. But Troy 7 had arrows buried in the walls And all of the buildings were burned to the ground and bodies were left in the streets. Now that's a pretty good sign that the city was pillaged. If you're having trouble following me on Troy 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, or 7, you have to remember that over thousands of years, if you had a city in one spot and then it burnt to the ground, that whole city is now the layer of dirt. And if a hundred years go by and someone comes back and builds a city on top of that ruins, that's a new layer. You dig below those streets, you'll find the ruins of the old one. Now you got to imagine over thousands of years, one city could be prosperous, full of life, and then something goes wrong, burnt to the ground. Now it's ruins. Hundred years later, a new city built right on top of those ruins. Four hundred years go by, something terrible happens, that city crumbles to the ground. Now you have two layers of ruins on top of each other. And then another group comes by and builds on top of that. So imagine nine layers of one city. It's amazing what archaeologists can do now. The Iliad is an epic poem about the Trojan War, and it was written with immense detail. This story follows many heroes from Greece, made up of separate tribes, who came together to fight the great city of Troy. Now, the Iliad is made up of 24 separate books, but the Iliad itself is only a small portion of a greater story. To paint the picture of Greek stories about the Trojan War, 
I have to recite from many other books. Because this series of books will give you a good idea of what Greek culture was all about. And for over a thousand years, these stories were told daily in every household. Now the first book is known as the Cypria. However, this book is lost. We have no copies of it. We only know of it because later texts refer to it and quote from it. Now, these events predate the Trojan War, but actually set up the events quite well. You see, it starts with the marriage of Peleus, a human, and Thetis, a nymph, who had a child named Achilles. Now, at the wedding between this human and goddess, all of the gods attended, because they are gods, and they wouldn't miss another god's wedding. Except one goddess who was not invited. Now, that was Eris, the goddess of despair. She wasn't invited because she would only ruin the wedding. But she managed to find a way to ruin the party despite not being invited. She sent a golden apple and placed it in the center of the party and had inscribed on it to the fairest goddess. Immediately, three goddesses tried and attested that the apple was meant for them because they were the fairest, Athena, Aphrodite, and Hera. They couldn't decide who the fairest was, so they asked Zeus to decide for them. And Zeus, being the wise man that he was, refused to walk into that trap and instead hurled the apple as far away as he could. The golden apple landed on a mountaintop where young Paris was playing his lyre. And when Paris found this golden apple, he picked it up. And instantaneously, the three goddesses magically appeared before him. They told him that he was to choose between the three. Which one is the fairest? Athena offered victory in battle. Hera offered him prosperity and a healthy marriage. And Aphrodite offered Paris the most beautiful woman in the world. Now immediately Paris gave the golden apple to Aphrodite. Luckily for Paris, the most beautiful woman in the world also happened to be Greek and lived not too far from him. Very convenient. Unfortunately, she was already married. But that didn't matter to Aphrodite. Helen happened to be married to the king's brother, Menelaus of Lacedaemonia, the kingdom which would evolve into Sparta. If you couldn't tell, Helen was the most beautiful woman in the world. And this is the same Helen that was born from the eggs. Aphrodite sent young Paris, the prince of Troy, on a diplomatic mission to Lacedaemonia. And once Paris was alone with Helen, he took her back to Troy. Now, it is unsure whether or not he took her forcefully, or if he used some kind of charm. But we do know that he took her from Sparta back to Troy. And while the king and Menelaus were away. And when the king finally got home and found out that his wife had been abducted, he freaked out. And he went into a frenzy. He summoned the leaders from all the Achaean tribes and convinced them it was time to sail across the Aegean Sea to the city of Troy to take back his wife. King Agamemnon was to go from tribe to tribe, convincing them to go to war with him. And a lot of people didn't want to go to war, including a man named Odysseus, who pretended to be insane like real crazy, so he could stay at home on his farm. You see, if you get called to war, there's no one left to farm your land. If there's no one left to farm your land, who's going to feed your family? There was a big incentive to want to stay home. So Odysseus went as far as he could to prove himself insane. 
Odysseus went as far as connecting both his horse and cow to a plow, just to look a little extra crazy. And while Agamemnon watched Odysseus try to plow his field with a horse and cow struggling next to each other, the king thought this was suspicious, so he tested him. And he took Odysseus's son, Telemachus, and placed him in front of the plow, forcing Odysseus to step in and save the young boy. Now this proved to Agamemnon that Odysseus was of good character and ready to go to war for him. And it seemed that a lot of people were reluctant to sail across the sea to a faraway kingdom and risk everything for the king's brother's wife. The king even had trouble recruiting the great Achilles to go to war. You see, Achilles' mother, Thetis, knew that her son would die if he went to war with Agamemnon. So when Odysseus and the king came strolling into town to recruit fighters, Thetis dressed her son up as a girl and hid him with all the other girls. At first, Agamemnon was suspicious that this might have happened, but instead of searching all of the girls individually, he thought it would be better to just lay out a trap. In one place, he laid out a bunch of necklaces and bracelets and earrings, and all of the girls went checking it out. They had to see what this sparkly stuff was all about. And on the other side of the room, he laid out a series of weapons and armor. And all of the boys went to check that out too. And Agamemnon noticed that there was one really large girl checking out the armor. And this is how they found Achilles. And as soon as they proposed the war to him, Achilles signed up. And his mother was devastated. Finally, the army was gathered, and they were ready to set sail for Troy. But the winds were not in their favor. The goddess Artemis told King Agamemnon that if he would sacrifice his daughter, Iphigenia, she will blow their sails to Troy. Now, unfortunately, you know, King Agamemnon, he had his whole army, he's ready to sail. Someone told him the only way he could go was to sacrifice his daughter. And this man did it. He sacrificed his own daughter. And just like that, the wind picked up. And his army set sail for Troy. With the goddess Artemis blowing the wind in their sails. The Iliad only takes place in the last year of the Trojan War, and only during 100 days or less, and it doesn't even talk about the end of the Trojan War. What is important to note is that the Iliad is not about the Trojan War. The war started long before it and ended long after it. The Iliad is about the rage of the gods, as is quoted in the opening line. This is about supernatural anger or hatred. Anger of the gods. Achilles was, after all, half man and half god, which meant his anger was extra crazy strong. But his ability to self-control was compromised with his father's weak human DNA. The Iliad begins with the capture of Chryseus, the daughter of Chrysus. Achilles took her as his prize of war, and she became his favorite concubine. However, it turned out that Chrysus was a priest of Apollo, so he prayed to Apollo to get his daughter back. Apollo responds by sending a plague through the camp of the besiegers, killing many of them and weakening the rest. This forces Agamemnon to send Chryseus back to her father in order to end the plague. This humiliated Achilles in front of his men. By taking away his earned prize, it was like stripping him away of a medal. Achilles was pissed off at Agamemnon and morale started to fade in the camp after that. At the gates of Troy, Menelaus challenges Paris to one-on-one -on -one combat, the winner takes Helen. This would save the lives of all these men who were about to start killing each other. Paris does not want to fight Menelaus, but it is what everyone else wants to see. But he does accept. And on the battlefield, Menelaus has the upper hand the entire time. 
He is stronger and faster and more experienced fighter, and he grabs Paris by the plume on his helmet and dragged him around the battlefield like a rag doll. Menelaus is about to slay Paris when Aphrodite flies in and intercedes. She picks up Paris and flies him safely to his bedroom, back inside the city of Troy. Aphrodite then finds Helen and tells her to get into bed with Paris, but she doesn't want to. It is quite clear at this point that she does not like Paris, at least not any more as she did before. But Aphrodite is a goddess and she forces Helen into bed with Paris. While they're in bed together, Helen tells Paris that she wished he had died on the battlefield. She was probably starting to miss her home in Sparta. She had been away for 10 years, and even if she had left willingly and in love at first, she had changed her mind. When she saw Menelaus fighting for her honor with an entire army ready to take her home to Sparta, she is literally trapped by Aphrodite in a place she doesn't want to be. Hector began by leading a charge outside the gates when he sees the Achaean army in disarray. Achilles was refusing to fight with Agamemnon, and the whole time the Trojan army was getting closer to their ships. Things were starting to look desperate, and Achilles' stubborn refusal to fight put his friend Patroclus in a bad situation. Knowing he needed to boost morale and lead his troops into battle to push back the Trojan charge, the young Pericles put on Achilles' battle armor and led a charge. Knowing he needed to boost morale and lead his troops into battle to push back the Trojan charge, young Patroclus put on Achilles' battle armor and led a charge. All of the men thought it was the real Achilles, so they followed him into battle. It was on the battlefield that Hector saw Achilles, or at least he thought, and killed him in combat. When Hector took the mask off, he realized that he had just killed Achilles' very best friend, Patroclus. Achilles went mad with rage and fury and took his attention away from Agamemnon and focused it on Hector. Every single breath Achilles breathed was one of rage and anger and he was ready to explode. He marches straight onto the battlefield to find Hector and after shouting his name he faces off against him in one-on-one -on -one combat. Killing Hector and dragging his body back to camp. He is so angry that even avenging Patroclus wasn't enough. He tied Hector's body to his chariot and rode him around the walls for King Priam to see. To us, that is sacrilege. To the Greeks, that was insanely bad and out of line. If you didn't bury the fallen properly, they were damned to wander in this plain and never find peace. Not only that, but if he gouged the eyes out of Hector on earth, then he would be blind in Hades as well. And that terrified King Priam that his firstborn son was going to be mutilated for eternity in Hades. Priam can't stand it anymore. He ends up walking out of the gates, putting his entire kingdom at risk, and walks straight into the besiegers' camp, knowing full well that if they caught him they could basically win the war right away. But the crying father walks straight up to Achilles and begs him for his son's body back. He kisses Achilles' hand and begs for his dead son's mercy. And it is finally at this moment in the Iliad that Achilles' anger finally relents. The godlike, furious anger that was burning inside of Achilles goes out, and he allows King Priam to take his son's body back to burial. This is where the Iliad ends. The war is still going, and nothing has been resolved. But Achilles' godlike anger was curbed by the human plea of a sad father for his dead son's body. The Iliad gave a detailed plot for every single character. It wasn't like a movie where there were extras. Homer went into detail on everyone. He took death very seriously and made sure that each one was a tragedy. And considering Homer wrote the Iliad from a Greek perspective, he was very sympathetic of Hector and his family. Now, after the Iliad, there are other books that talk about the Trojan War. There's the Ethiopus which talks about the Amazonian women and the Ethiopians who joined the Trojans in battle. In this book, Achilles is killed by Paris. And after this is the Iliad Micra, or the Little Iliad. 
In this book, Paris ends up getting killed by Philectetes, the son of Achilles. The son of Achilles, Neoptolemus, joins the Greek army, and it is in this book that they start building the Trojan horse. The Ilia Persis covers the fall of Troy, and in this book the Greeks feign a retreat and leave a wooden horse as a gift of surrender. The Trojan horse is taken through the gates and left in the city courtyard. In the middle of the night, in the middle of the night, a small hatch opened on the bottom of the wooden horse, and Greek soldiers came climbing out. They ran for the city gates where the Greek army was waiting, and they opened it up. The entire Greek army stormed through the gates, and they sacked the city of Troy, burning every building to the ground, murdering most and enslaving the rest. The son of Achilles, Neoptolemus, found the Trojan king Priam, and he begged at Neoptolemus' feet, but was ultimately slain without mercy. There is also an account of Greeks chasing a priestess up the hill and into the temple of Athena, where they brutally raped her, desecrating the temple. And in this act, they turned Athena against the Greeks, who had been on their side all the way up until this point. The next book is called the Nestoi. And in this book, Athena is angry at the Greeks for raping the priestess in her own temple. And when the Greek ships set sail for home, after ten years of sieging Troy, Athena blows up a storm that scatters the ships, stranding many and drowning many others. It is this event that throws Odysseus off course in the Odyssey. Menelaus and Helen are reunited on their own ship when they get blown off course and end up in Egypt. They end up spending seven years in Egypt, making sacrifices every year, hoping to one day return to their homeland. One of the few to get home relatively quickly is the king Agamemnon himself. But when he does return home, it is not a happy wife that greets him. You see, his wife, Clytemnestra, was furious and angry with Agamemnon for sacrificing their daughter Iphigenia. She murdered her husband in retribution, leaving her son in the sticky position of honoring the father or the mother. You see, he must avenge his father's death, which means he must now kill his mother. After leaving the now burned to the ground city of Troy, Odysseus and his men sail in the direction of home. Odysseus and his men land their ship on a strange island. They are hungry and thirsty, and Odysseus takes several men and six large bags of wine to trade for assistance. They travel through the forests and hills until they find a large cave with a huge boulder pushed to the side, as if the boulder used to block the entrance to the cave but had recently been moved out of the way. The six men wander into the cave and find a large fire burning in the center with an even larger wooden chair. As they walk closer to the chair, they realize that it was over three times their size. Several of Odysseus' men start to panic and wanted to leave the cave at once. They knew something was wrong and that they were in danger. Before they could run out of the cave, a giant cyclops walked inside and pulled the large boulder shut, sealing them inside of the cave. The cyclops walked up to the fire. He could smell the intruders, and he demanded they show themselves. The humans climbed out from below the chair and showed themselves to the giant cyclops. Odysseus then stepped forward and introduced himself to the cyclops and said that he was a traveler in search of nourishment and nothing more. In fact, he stated that Zeus himself had ordered him to be treated with hospitality. At the sound of Zeus' name, the cyclops laughed. I don't care about Zeus, said the Cyclops. I only fear my father Poseidon. The Cyclops then reached down and grabbed two of Odysseus' men and put them into a small sack. The men screamed as the sack was tied up and the Cyclops threw them over his shoulder. I'm going to go eat dinner, said the Cyclops. You are welcome to stay the night. The Cyclops laughed as he brought the men down the cave and cooked them and ate them. The rest of the Greeks were stuck inside and couldn't escape and had to wait before the Cyclops grew hungry again. 
The Cyclops opened up the cave by pushing the boulder out of the way and let the morning light into the cave. He then let his giant sheep come running back into the cave where they took shelter. It turns out the Cyclops was a herder and had five giant sheep. The Cyclops walked up to the men and was about to grab two more to eat when Odysseus offered the Cyclops his large bag of wine. The Cyclops was delighted to drink the wine and downed it really quick. He asked for another and another until eventually he drank all six sacks of wine. Now the Cyclops was very drunk and also tired. He lay down on the cave floor and before falling asleep he asked Odysseus his name. When Odysseus told him his name, the Cyclops promised that he would eat him last. After a quick chuckle, the Cyclops fell asleep on the cave floor. Odysseus and his men stepped into action and took the staff of the Cyclops, sharpened the end, and then all six ran the spike right through the Cyclops' eyeball. The Cyclops freaked out and smashed everything trying to find the man who blinded him. Knowing that he could catch them right away, at least not with his five sheep still inside, the Cyclops opened the cave entrance and lied down in front of the entrance. He then shouted into the cave, Once I count that all five sheep have left the cave, I am going to close this boulder and hunt you down. Fortunately for Odysseus, the sheep were large enough for the men to grab hold of the fluff and grip to the bellies of the sheep. As they walked over the stomach of the Cyclops, he patted their heads and counted until all five sheep had crossed his stomach. With all the sheep, and now Greeks outside the cave, the Cyclops pulled the boulder back into place and went hunting for the humans hiding in his cave. The Cyclops cursed Odysseus, then prayed to his father Poseidon to curse the man who blinded him. Poseidon listened to the Cyclops' prayers and sent a terrible wind upon Odysseus that his boat became lost in the thunderstorms and black clouds and eventually crash-landed on the shores of another strange island. But this time they are full of cannibals, and they almost kill everyone, and they destroy all but Odysseus' ship, forcing everyone onto one boat. Many died. After their ship ran aground on another strange island covered in a forest, they recognized the island as that of the witch Circe. Now, the adventures of Odysseus could be easily stretched out over an entire podcast. So what I strongly recommend is if you are interested in Greek mythology, I would recommend you check out the podcast, Let's Talk About Myths, Baby. It's actually a very inspirational podcast that made me want to include a few episodes of Greek mythology into our series. Uh, Once again, uh, that podcast is called Let's Talk About Myths, Baby. It's a great podcast. And for the purposes of uh, shortening our episode... I'll just tell you that the uh, adventures of Odysseus ends up taking him into Hades, where he ends up running into other characters from the Trojan War. But eventually, after many years and fathering a couple children, Odysseus makes it back to Ithaca. But it takes ten long years. Meanwhile, back in Ithaca, Penelope was getting suitors from all kinds of men. They all thought Odysseus was dead, so why shouldn't they come to his house and hit on his wife? Penelope found a way to keep them at bay by pretending to knit a quilt in memory of her late husband. But she always unraveled the quilt at night, forcing her to start over. And it only took about a year before the suitors found out and moved in to ask for her hand in marriage. You see, unfortunately, Odysseus, now alone ended up on another island, all alone, except with a nymph named Calypso. This immortal nymph held him hostage on this tiny little island for seven years. But after becoming depressed and missing his home and beautiful wife, Penelope, he wanted nothing more than to go home and see her. After seven years, he finally built a tiny raft and sailed off the little island until Poseidon blew up another storm and he ended up on another island where he met a young lady named Nausicaa who showed him into town, who showed him into town and introduced him to the king. Now the king asked Odysseus to enter his court 
to entertain his court. So Odysseus recalled the many adventures from the Trojan War and their travels home. The king was so impressed with his tales that he had his bard write them down. And after the king dismissed Odysseus from his court with directions on how to find Ithaca. Afterwards, the king dismissed Odysseus from his court and gave him directions on how to find Ithaca. When Odysseus landed in Ithaca, his home, he found all of these different men lining up to marry his wife. And he got rightfully pissed off, and he planned a way to deal with these intruders who were trying to take his family away from him. It is at this time that Odysseus met up with his son for the first time in over 20 years. And they were very happy to see each other. Odysseus didn't give away his identity right away. And he tricked the suitors in his own home into thinking he was some old feeble man. And only after they taunted him and made fun of him and ridiculed him, did Odysseus challenge them to a competition at throwing axes and swords. And this old man beat every last one of them. And it was at this point that Odysseus' son closed the doors to the home, leaving all of these suitors alone with Odysseus. And it was at that moment that they realized just who they were looking at, who they were dealing with. They grew terrified, but it was too late. Odysseus pulled out his sword and he cut every one of these men down. He hunted down every suitor in his home and he slayed them all with his sword. He went into a blood rage. A rage that took him back to his time on the battlefield at the siege of Troy. And after hacking and slashing and killing mercilessly every man in his house, he finally calmed down and he went to go find his wife. And while he was with his wife, he revealed himself. And he no longer looked like the old man. And his wife finally recognized him. His wife, Penelope. She was super happy to see him home. And he spent some quality time with her. But he just couldn't shake the anger that was festering up inside of him. Even though the suitors were all dead, he wanted nothing more to bring them all back to life and kill them again. His rage was not going away. Even at home, when he had no reason to be upset, he was still bloodthirsty and angry. And he could not forget about all of the battles he had been in during the Trojan War, all of his friends who had died, the ten years he spent on that beach sieging the city. But he was still extremely angry. And he told his wife he would be right back. Odysseus got on a ship and he set sail for a secret passage to the underworld. To the realm of Hades. There he found the same suitors who he had killed in his home. And he battled them all over again. Cutting them down twice over. And while he was in a blood rage psychopathic attack... Athena came down and broke up the fight. She told Odysseus to back off. The war is over. These are not your enemies. You need to go home and remember the war is over. The end of the Odyssey is an end to a never-ending cycle of violence. But it's more. It's also what happens once you go home from war. How you put war away. It's a serious lesson for many new generations of Greeks to follow. Because many of them would find them in similar situations. And that's why this story was so popular to tell amongst every generation at the theater. Because many of them would go off to war and they had to teach them how to leave the anger on the battlefield. And not to bring it back home. How to act once you came back. 
This is also a unique Greek hero because he does not defeat his enemy by overpowering them with strength, but instead Odysseus outwits his foes and uses his brain to get out of most of his problems. Now the last book in this series is called the Telegony or Telegony. Telegonus, a son of Odysseus from that time he slept with Circe on the island, had been searching for his father his entire life. Now his mother Circe told him that his father was from Ithaca. So Telogonus set sail for Ithaca to find his father. Now it isn't until he reaches Ithaca that he gets into a fight with a man at night. And he ends up killing this man. And later he realized just who he killed. Telegonus had actually gotten into a fight with his father, and he killed him. Now, feeling absolutely terrible for murdering his father by mistake, he took his half-brother and Odysseus's wife Penelope back to the island of Circe, where his witch mother turned Penelope and her son immortal. On this island, they buried Odysseus's body, and on this island... They buried Odysseus's body. Now this wraps up our segment on Greek mythology. We aren't going into any more Greek myths, as we have actual writing to source now instead of oral traditions handed down for hundreds of years. So our next episode is going to go back into the narrative and talk about Greece during the Archaic period. Well, that's it for today. Join us next time on the history of modern Greece. Stay safe and stay awesome.